Hello, Jim Schwimmer here. Welcome to today's vlog. A couple of small items and then on to the main item for today, which unfortunately, like yesterday's item, will be a, a sad item. But first, these short uh, items that I want to cover first. First one is Washington, D.C. Uh, let me put this screenshot up for you. Now, what you're seeing there is on the right side of the screen. That's Charles Payne. He's a host on the Fox Business Channel. He's interviewing the person on the right whose name I don't remember, but he is a Republican representative in the House of Representatives talking about Nancy Pelosi keeping the mask mandate on in the House, requiring everybody, whether they've been vaccinated or not, to wear a mask, even though the CDC says you don't have to. And the, well, where I am in Tennessee, the restrictions are almost completely gone. The only places that I'm seeing restrictions still are these national chain Starbucks. You don't have to wear a mask to go in, but you can only get stuff to go. You can't sit down yet, but somebody who works at Starbucks uh, that I spoke to on the phone told me that they expect that to change by the end of the month. So starting in June at the latest, if this person is right, then I'll be able to go sit in Starbucks again with my laptop computer and use their electricity <laughs> instead of mine, which will compensate for the expensive coffee that doesn't really taste that good. But don't get me started on that. So you see on the right, this congressman complaining about Pelosi keeping the mask mandate on. And they're being fined, by the way, $500 a day at first, going up to $2,500 a day for every day that they come onto the floor without a mask. And Pelosi is saying that she may even change the rules so that people who don't have a mask on cannot even come onto the floor at all. But now look at the left side of the picture. Now, it's a little hard to see what happened was I was watching this happening on TV. I keep this channel on while I'm working. I have a home office. And then I heard this discussion and I went over. So I did a screen grab as quickly as I could while it was going on. The woman in that lower left-hand corner, that is Nancy Pelosi. Unfortunately, she wasn't turned fully towards me when I did the screenshot. But if you look carefully, Carefully, you'll see that, well, this is what was reported as I was watching this. She is not wearing a mask. She's not wearing a mask, so she's making everybody in the house wear a mask, and she is too, but she's perfectly happy to go to the White House and not wear a mask. So there's your uh, hypocrisy example of the day. As people have said, uh, including this uh, congressman, I believe, it's all about control, uh, uh, this whole mask thing. I think it's total nonsense. I think it always has been. That's just me. I could be wrong. But the CDC guidelines are clear that you don't need to wear one. And people are saying she just wants to have control and tell people what to do. Uh, that's what it's starting to look like. That's the first item. Item number two, I'm just going to put this up here. This is very interesting. Uh, it's just a little tweet, but it makes sense. Dear liberal comrades, you know how you don't trust people, which is why you want everyone to wear a mask, even those that are vaccinated, because you think they're lying. Now you understand why we want people to show ID when they vote good day. So there's your second example of hypocrisy too. The, and try to get into the Democratic National Convention when they hold the next one uh, without ID and see how far you get. So uh, as I said, number two, hypocrisy. What do we got here? Number three. Okay, now we get to the main subject. I, I was talking yesterday about Jews being attacked by Arabs and not in the Middle East. I mean, it's happening in the Middle East, of course, but I'm talking about the United States of America now. I'm talking about cities in the United States, and I'm going to show you uh, a couple of videos again, and I'm going to quote from an article explaining what I have said. I think I've said it in the past, but it's definitely something I wanted to say, but a, a writer, a conservative writer named Victor Davis Hanson beat me to it, so I'm just going to quote him. And by the way, full disclosure, I'm a conservative. Always keep that in mind when you evaluate whatever I say. And wouldn't it be nice, as I've said in the past, if journalists would do what I just did and just uh, not claim to be objective, but admit their biases up front so that we could all keep that in mind. 
uh, while we uh, you know consider what they say. Though having said that, if we're talking to mainstream media, just guess that they're a liberal and you'll be right, I would say, almost all of the time. So maybe it would just be superfluous, but uh, it would be a nice gesture anyhow. But here we go. I'm going to show you the video, but first let me give you the tweet that has the video embedded in it. Anti-Semitism in Manhattan. Jews being attacked by Muslims on Manhattan's Upper East Side. We must fight. And then below, places where Jews have been attacked in past weeks. And now the video. <laughs> Welcome back. And by the way, the person who posted that video, Dov Hickind, he is a Democrat, a liberal Democrat in Manhattan. He used to be on the city council. He no longer is. He retired some time ago, but uh, he or just chose not to run, I guess. That would be another, another way to phrase it. But uh, he's been very on top of this issue. But you see, he's a Democrat. And I think he even supported Donald Trump in, in the last election. So maybe he's not as much of a Democrat as he thinks he is. Maybe he's like Vernon Jones, the Georgia uh, state uh, House representative, a Democrat who criticized his fellow Democrats and then finally just switched parties. And he's now a Republican and he seems very happy and we are happy to have him. But you saw the video. That's uh, New York City. Now here is, uh, well, first of all, let me just give you this list of cities where this is happening cities and countries so we'll well let's go down the list here this is again from the dove hickine places where jews have been attacked in past weeks toronto new york city los angeles washington dc seattle south florida germany and london so we'll just stick with the cities right now new york city los angeles Washington, D.C., Seattle, South Florida, of course, is not a city, but that's a geographic area of Florida. But what matters about South Florida is that it is mostly liberal. It's, it's like purple tending towards blue. There are, are conservatives there, but uh, you could consider it liberal or tending towards liberal. The other cities are definitely strong liberal Democrats, have been in charge there governing for literally decades. And that's where this is happening. I, as I said yesterday, I live in the South. I live outside of Memphis. I have never seen anything like this in all the time I've been here. In fact, something I forgot to mention yesterday, I saw somebody down here come into a Starbucks. I assume he was Jewish. He was wearing a T-shirt with a very strong pro-Israel slogan on it. I don't, don't remember the exact statement that was on the T-shirt, but nobody paid him any mind. Nobody paid him any mind. But uh, you can see what would happen in Manhattan and in Los Angeles, as I showed you yesterday, these roving bands of Arabs who are just attacking Jews, looking for, well, in LA, it was outside a, a, a Jewish restaurant. I, as I, I don't remember the exact name of the restaurant, but it was pretty, it was a sushi place. Maybe it was kosher sushi, something like that. But you can see in this screenshot from Manhattan, es a bagel, that's a Yiddish, eat a bagel, but that's obviously a Jewish establishment. So these Arab thugs went hunting for Jews and they went to, just as if you were hunting deer, went to the place where they would expect Jews to be. And I just want to add really quickly, as I did yesterday, that I have a lot of Arab friends. That's why this is especially distressing to me. One of my best friends is an Arab. 
And he's as disgusted by this as I am. So I wanted to make that clear that I'm not branding all Arabs because of what these guys are doing. These are Islamists. That's basically it. In fact, I'm going to, uh, I think if I could do it tomorrow, I want to get back to the domestic issues starting tomorrow, I hope, unless we have more of these. But uh, right now I'm focusing on this because, well, for one thing, the Maricopa County ballot audit, it has been shut down for the week to make room for some high school graduations, and then they'll be back next week. But if I do have a chance in a future vlog, I'll show you a, a video from a, a Syrian Arab, an Arab in Syria, Remember, they fought a, a war and very much on the side of the Israelis. This woman, I would love to, I could have done it today, but I don't want to make this too long. And plus, I, I forgot. I didn't think about it. Okay, I'm going to confess. I forgot. But I'm going to do it. Um, I'm going to do a vlog on the strong support that we are seeing from Arabs all over the world for Israel. And I would also mention, I guess I got to throw this in, that the Abraham Accords that our liberal friends are criticizing, they're working. The countries that are, well, except for, you know, liberals in the United States and then some European countries, but in the Middle East, it's the usual suspects that are uh, attacking Israel verbally now. I mean, the people in, in you, you know, Lebanon, Hezbollah, those people. But I, from the, the ordinary population of Lebanon, I haven't heard anything. But most important, from the United Arab Emirates, from Bahrain, from Sudan, not a peep out of them. They, they understand that uh, the problem is Hamas. It's not Israel. They're just defending themselves. But anyways, I want to show you this one more video. This video makes a very good point. I'll just let you watch the video because you have people making these openly anti-Semitic statements, holding Israel to a double standard. But they say, well, we're not anti-Semitic. We're just anti-Zionist. This answers that question or replies to that contention. If, as you just saw and saw yesterday, if you tuned in, if anti-Zionism isn't anti-Semitism, why are Palestinians attacking Jews in places like New York, Los Angeles, Washington, D.C.? And as you can see, below South Florida. And well, definitely in the case of New York, Los Angeles, and Washington, D.C., it's not going to be mentioned in this video, but I have to say one reason is because they're, they're liberal cities. And the Democratic Party is becoming increasingly, I'm sorry to say, anti-Semitic. Well, as I said yesterday, called the Corbinization, that's a term people are using, Corbinization of the Democratic Party, referring to Jeremy Corbyn, who was an anti-Semitic leader of the British Labour Party. There was a big scandal there of uh, just discovering emails and tweets and things like that from Labour Party members of Parliament, very just openly anti-Semitic statements. It was a big scandal about the party. It's really hurt them in the recent elections. It was a big scandal for the party. And it looks like the same thing is happening to the Democratic Party. We'll see how long our so-called objective media can keep a lid on this. Uh, I predict for quite a while. Anyways, here is a video. Watch the video and then I'll be back with uh, explanation courtesy of Victor Davis Hansen.
Welcome back. Nothing really to say about that video speaks for itself. So I'm going to go right to Victor Davis Hanson. Here's the headline. Why does the left seemingly hate Israel? And the explanation he gives is exactly what I have been saying. I don't think I've had time to put it into a vlog yet. But now I don't have to because he's doing it unless I want to treat it separately, separate vlog. But why does the left seemingly hate Israel? With more than 3,000 rockets having been fired into Israel by Hamas recently, the Democratic Party seems paralyzed over how to respond to the latest Middle East war. It is not just that they fear that, quote, the squad, unquote, Black Lives Matter, the shock troops of Antifa, and woke institutions such as academia and the media are now unapologetically anti-Israel. They are also terrified that anti-Israelism is becoming synonymous with rank anti-Semitism. And soon the Democratic Party will end up as disdained as the British Labor Party under Jeremy Corbyn, which I just discussed a moment ago. The new core of the Democrats, as emblemized by Representatives Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez of New York, Ilhan Omar of Minnesota, and Rashida Tlaib of Michigan, has in the past questioned the patriotism of American Jews who support Israel, and occasionally has had to apologize for puerile anti-Semitic rants, but I will just uh, jump in here, but uh, for which they have never been held accountable in the House of Representatives. The left claims it champions consensual government and believes the United States must use its soft power clout to isolate autocracies. But the Palestinian Authority and Hamas refuse to hold free and regularly scheduled elections. If an Israeli strongman ever suspended free elections and ruled through brutality, USA Aid would be severed within days. If history and democratic values can't explain the apparent hatred of Israel on the left, perhaps human rights violations do. But here too there is another example of radical asymmetry. Arab citizens of Israel enjoy far greater constitutional protections than do Arabs living under either the Palestinian Authority or Hamas. Is the left bothered by the allies of Hamas? After all, most are autocracies such as Iran and North Korea. We return then to other reasons for the woke contempt directed toward Israel. In part, the Western left always despises the unapologetically successful, as if they are inevitably beneficiaries of unfair privilege. Underdog Israel was not so hated from 1947 to 1967. Then it was poorer, more socialist, and in danger of being extinguished by its many neighboring enemies. And I want to dwell on this for a second because, as you can tell, I was born quite some time ago. So I was... Uh, I think I was about 17, 15 or 17 during the, let me 52, yeah, 15 <laughs> during, do the quick math, about 15 years old during the 67 war. And I remember very well, up to that time, before the 67 war, everybody, especially liberals, felt sorry for Israel, poor little Israel, surrounded by all these enemies and uh, 
Then the 67 war and Israel defeated five surrounding much more populous countries within six days. And that is when the tide turned. That is when the left became anti-Israel because, uh, well, I'll be frank, because Jews won, put it that way. Jews are supposed to be, were supposed to be trampled on and spat on and discriminated against and, and not to have, a, in my case, a homeland, in the case of the Israelis, a, a country, but a, a, whole, a spiritual homeland from where my people came. Just like an Irish American has Ireland, uh, an Italian American has Italy, so I, I have Israel. Uh, I have, uh, I guess for me, it would be the kingdom of Israel, the ancient ki kingdom of Israel. And, you know, I, I guess I could talk about it now a little bit because uh, I have personal experience with this. Maybe some of you uh, out there have. If you're Jewish, maybe you have. If you have, have, you still, if you're a Christian, you may know some Jews in your school when you were younger where this happened. But I would get in fights sometime with, with four Christians. Four Christians would just jump on me. But uh, one time, uh, a Christian, I guess he, he got uh, a little full of himself and he hit me, but he was alone. I slugged him back and the look on his face, it wasn't that I just, it wasn't just that I slugged him back. It was a look on his face. He was surprised to experience a Jew fighting back because we're not supposed to. We're supposed to just let whatever happens to us happen to us. And I have to inform some people, the, the, our friends on the left, that those days are over. Israel fights back and they can. They fight back and they win. And if you don't like it, too bad to be honest, but uh, be perfectly frank. But that's when the tide turned as far as sympathy, support for Israel from the left, from the far left. When And maybe also because they turned away from socialism. That could be another reason. And, and now they're, they're free market economy. That could be a reason also. But there's actually another reason now that I think of it that Hansen doesn't mention, which is that the Arabs themselves, see, this is something else I remember, before the 67 war and even during it and immediately after the war, all you heard from, from the Arabs, from the Egyptians, uh, the Jordanians was, we're going to throw the Jews into the sea. That was their mantra. That was their, their promise, if they had won, to throw the Jews into the sea. In other words, to kill them all, or like perhaps the lucky ones would just be exiled, or as happened for thousands of years, live under the thumb of, of Arabs as, uh, as not even second-class citizens. But that wasn't working. That wasn't catching hold in the United States or Europe, where they have religious tolerance. So the narrative changed shortly, like about the early 70s, where they stopped talking about throwing the Jews into the sea, and they stopped saying Jews, they, except for Hamas and, and people like that. But they would say Zionists instead of Jews, and Palestinians would characterize themselves, and Europeans and liberals would characterize the Palestinians as brown, uh, black, oppressed people being oppressed by white colonialists, never mind that Jews are the uh, indigenous population who have been there continuously. Even when the Romans exiled the Jews, they didn't exile all of them. They exiled about 80 percent. We've been there continuously for 3,000 years. The Arabs, on the other hand, came in the Arab conquest of 638, uh, the year 638, and these people are, are descendants of that, of those people, or, interestingly, descendants of Jews, descendants of Jews who were forcibly converted to Islam, and perhaps a few converted voluntarily. The point is that Israelis, even the Jews, in fact, the finalist, if I can find a photo of her, the Israeli finalist in the Eurovision Song Contest is black. Because there are Ethiopian Jews who are, are, who are black, and I haven't seen any skin color that dark from any Palestinian that I've seen. That I uh, certainly none of the Mahmoud Abbas is not. Point is, Israelis and Palestinians, Israel, they're, they're identical. They're identical. Physically, they're identical. So this whole mantra, meme, claim, whatever you want to call it. 
that the Israelis are white colonialists oppressing uh, native black populations similar to, say, uh, the French in Algeria. Uh, it's nonsense. It's total nonsense. But back to the article, and it's provable, total nonsense, demonstrable. Total nonsense. But back to the article. But after the victories in the 1967 and 1973 wars, the Israeli military proved unconquerable in the region, no matter how large the numbers, wealth, and armaments of its many enemies. For the left, Israel's current strength, confidence, and success mean it cannot be seen as a victim, but only as a victimizer. That's the key point. As its Iron Dome missile defenses knock down the flurry of Hamas rockets and its planes take out the military installations that launch those rockets, the left bizarrely believes Israel wins too easily and acts, quote, disproportionately, unquote. Again, that's a problem that Jews win, so deal with it. The left also has a strange idea of current, quote, imperialism, unquote, and, quote, colonialism, unquote. What I was talking about about just a moment ago, but Hansen expands on what I was just saying. The general rule is that Westerners cannot settle in numbers in the non-West. But the reversal is certainly not true. Millions of Middle Easterners are welcomed into Belgium, France, Germany, the UK, and the United States. Yet Jews have been in what is now Israel since nearly the dawn of civilization, and their 1947 borders only grew after they were attacked and threatened with extinction. The left claims that its anti-Israelism has nothing to do with anti-Semitism, but it is almost impossible now to make that distinction. When woke criticism obsesses over democratic Israel and ignores far greater oppressors and oppressed elsewhere. Hating democratic Israel while it is under attack is not just a reflection of the new woke and ethically bankrupt left. It is also a symptom of a deeper pathology in the West, one of moral equivalence, amoral relativism, and self-loathing. Hating Israel has become the surrogate Western way of hating oneself. And I'll just leave it there for today. As always, I appreciate your stopping by, spending time with me. If you could spend a little more time, I would appreciate a thumbs up if you like this video. Share with anybody you think would also like it or at least benefit from it, even if they don't like it. Any questions, suggestions, comments, comment section below the video. You can also subscribe. I love getting new subscribers. You can visit my other channels, my hot dog channel and my food channel. Links in the description. But most of all, come back and see me again. I really look forward to seeing all of you again. And until I do see all of you again, bye.